Good afternoon. Today I want to talk about genomes and genetics. So the genomes, of course, are the nucleic acid inside the virus particle. That's, good, that's incredibly important. It specifies everything that the virus is going to do. We'll talk about the different kinds of nucleic acids and the implications of them being different. Because viral genomes are very diverse, much more diverse than any other organisms on the planet. And then I want to talk about genetics, which of course is using the tools of, of genetics, like mutagenesis and so forth, to try and understand what genes do for a virus. I'm going to give you an idea of the kind of uh, approaches that we use, and these are going to be important throughout the course. Now all of this begins really in the 1950s. In the 1950s, a really important experiment was done which showed that the viral genome, the viral nucleic acid genome is actually the genetic code. And you may be thinking, what? Why would anyone think otherwise? Well, you know, DNA was discovered in 1889, I think it was. It wasn't until 19, 1944 that it was shown right here in New York City that, in bacteria at least, DNA is a genetic material. And until then, the, especially the early 1900s, people argued over whether proteins were the genetic material because proteins were way more diverse than nucleic acids. There were only four bases in nucleic acids, and people said, how could that be the genetic code? So in 1944, DNA was shown to be the genetic code of bacteria, and then in the 50s, the uh, nucleic acid of viruses was shown to be their genetic code. And of course, there were two different kinds of nucleic acid that we had discovered in viruses. We have uh, viruses with DNA genomes and viruses with RNA genomes. And uh, two separate groups uh, did this work. On the right, uh, an investigator named Frankel Conrad worked with tobacco mosaic virus, that first virus to be discovered. Lots of firsts were done with TMV. What he found is that you could separate the protein and the RNA component of TMV. And if you put the RNA component into a cell, it would initiate an infectious cycle. If you put the protein component in, it would not. If you combine both of them together, they would make an infectious virus particle. So that showed that the RNA was the genetic material. And then uh, the, the fact that DNA is genetic material was done by a, by a group, the Hershey Chase group out at Cold Spring Harbor. It's a very famous experiment, which I want to go over with you. And I'm sure you learned this in high school and maybe again here in biology, but I'll give you my twist on it. Uh, so Al Hershey here, very serious looking guy, was a scientist at Cold Spring Harbor, and he worked with Martha Chase. And in 1952, he published a paper where he did a really clever experiment. He said, okay, I wanna know if it's the DNA or the protein of a bacteriophage that gets into a cell and gives rise to new virus particles. So he radioactively labeled bacteriophages with either S35 to label the protein or P32 to label the DNA. So in this image you see viral protein labeled with sulfur in yellow and viral DNA labeled with radioactive phosphorus. And he took these viruses and put them on bacteria, let them attach, absorb, and then after a few minutes he sheared off the phages by putting the mix in a blender, a kitchen blender. And if you go to Cold Spring Harbor for a meeting, there's a library there, and in that library they have his, his kitchen blender that he used. It's this metal thing here. Of course, I don't know of any kitchen blender today that looks like that, but that, back in the day that was a kitchen blender. And it was a brilliant way to shear off the face so they would stop putting their nucleic acid in. Then he would let the bacteria grow and look at the next generation of phage that came out. And uh, so what he found, if you labeled the proteins, the new phage that were produced, the next generation of phage did not have any label in their proteins. But if you labeled the DNA, the next generation did have some DNA in their uh, some label in their DNA. Not all, because you have some new DNA synthesis, but some enough to convince him that the DNA is being incorporated into the next generation of phages. So this is a very famous experiment, and he repeated it over and over again throughout his career in different ways, and that gave rise to the saying, Hershey heaven. All right, so if you have a technique and you use it over and over again to get lots of papers, it's, we say that you're in Hershey heaven. 
All right. It's nothing to do with Hershey PA, where they make chocolate. It has to do with Al Hershey in this experiment. Now, what is interesting, and serendipity always plays a role in science. It turns out that some phages, the whole particle goes into the bacteria. So if he had picked one of those instead of this one, he would have gotten different results. And maybe he would have not figured it out for a couple of years. The whole particle gets in, so he would have seen both protein and nucleic acid radioactivity getting into the cell. So this told us that for this bacteriophage, DNA was the genetic material. And of course, it turns out to be for all DNA viruses as well. Now, there are lots of different viruses. You've already got a sense for how many different viruses are out there. And there are way more than I've told you about. There are lots of different infection strategies. But it turns out there are only seven different kinds of viral genomes. And I put the Subway 7 here so you'll remember it. Next time you go in the Subway, you'll see that purple 7. And you'll think of seven viral genome types. That way you cannot forget. That's a good way to look at it, right? And for the rest of your lives, whenever you see number seven, you're always going to think seven viral genome types. I guarantee it. Seven different kinds of viral genomes. It makes it really easy for you to understand. That's what I want to talk about today a bit, how we can use that to sort out the complexity uh, amongst viruses. And that's tied in with the seven genome types is tied in with this observation that all viral genomes, no matter what they are, have to make mRNA that can be read by host ribosomes. Because no virus encodes a translation system. The viral mRNAs must be translated by the host cell protein translation machinery. So all viruses have to make an mRNA that's compatible with it. All right, And every virus we know of has to do this. There's no exception as far as we can tell. The mRNA has to be ribosome ready. That's a ribosome. Does it remind you of anything else? Turkey, right. It reminds you of a turkey. It just happens to be that's the way the artist drew it. See, there's the leg. <laughs> and so we have lots of flying turkeys in this course. All viruses have to make mRNA that can be read. So David Baltimore took advantage of this. He was a, uh, he's, he's been a virologist his whole career. There he is uh, fishing. And uh, he won a Nobel Prize in the 70s, which we will talk about later for discovering reverse transcriptase. But in the early 70s, he was actually a student here in New York City. He said, OK, every virus has to make mRNA. So can we arrange the different kinds of viruses, the seven different virus types, uh, and make them all go to mRNA? So he devised what's called the Baltimore system or the Baltimore scheme, uh, and where he said he, he made a box in the middle with mRNA, and he said every virus genome has to reach it. At the time, there were only six known virus genomes, and later we discovered a seventh. He, he didn't have this number seven here. So he worked with six, but now we know there are seven, and they all have to get to mRNA. So you can make a very nice scheme, and that's it, which shows how each of the DNAs get to mRNA. And you can see the seven, they're labeled there. There's double-stranded DNA. There's single-stranded DNA. Uh, there's double-stranded RNA. Then there's single-stranded RNA uh, of minus sense. There's single-stranded RNA of plus sense. And there is single-stranded RNA, and this is all in virus particles, of plus sense RNA that goes through a DNA intermediate. All right? And now, before we go any further, we have to look at some nomenclature here so you know uh, what I mean when I say certain words. Any mRNA that has to be translated, or it's going to be translated, is the plus strand by convention. It's just something that someone devised a long time ago. It has nothing to do with electricity or polarity. It's just if someone had said it was the minus strand, it would have stuck. But it turned out they said, let's make it the plus strand. So all mRNA that has to be translated is the plus strand. And the DNA of the same polarity is also the plus strand. So if you look at the double-stranded DNA molecule, the plus strand is the one that has the same sequence as mRNA. And to make it, you have to copy the minus strand. So the complements of the plus strands, of course, the minus strands. And that goes for DNA and for RNA as well. OK, so we have plus and minus strands that we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about this for DNA uh, and for RNA. And the key is that the plus strand is the mRNA equivalent. However, and there are always howevers in science, right? Not all plus RNA is going to be translated. So it's the right polarity to be translated. But just because it's plus 
does not mean it's going to be translated into protein. We'll see some examples of that uh, today and throughout this course. But if something is translated, it has to be plus RNA. There's no way, there's no other way around it. And so if you start looking at the Baltimore scheme in terms of polarity, you can see how that factors in. For example, if you have a virus with a negative RNA genome, a negative strand RNA genome, in order to make mRNA, we simply have to copy the minus strand and make a plus strand. And that gives us plus mRNA. And that's the beauty of this scheme is that you could take, I could tell you any virus, a virus with a double-stranded RNA genome, and you could tell me exactly how it gets to mRNA without much thought. So that's the elegance. Knowing only the nature of the genome can deduce the basic steps that have to take place to make messenger RNA. Now, I always tell every year you to, you should commit this to memory, but it turns out you don't have to because when you take an exam here, I let you bring in a, a sheet of notes. So this is the one thing you should probably put on the sheet of notes if you don't feel like memorizing it. It does take a lot of space up though. You know, it's hard to compress this. But um, it will help you do a lot of things. It will help you answer a lot of questions. So again, you can, if I say a certain kind of, of genome, and we're going to go through them singly today, you can tell me exactly how they get to mRNA, what kind of reactions have to occur to get to mRNA. So here are the seven classes. We have double-stranded DNA. We have gapped double-stranded DNA. This is the one Baltimore didn't have in the 70s. It was discovered later. We have single-stranded DNA. So those are the three DNAs. We have uh, double-stranded RNA. We have single-stranded plus sense RNA. We have single-stranded minus sense RNA. So, so far we have three categories in each, in DNA and RNA. And that's really, you could think of those offhand on your own. But for the uh, RNA viruses, we have an additional class, these viruses with a plus RNA that go through a DNA intermediate. And this is one of those exceptions where that plus RNA that's in the virus particle, even though it's the same polarity as message, it is not translated when it goes into the cell for reasons that we'll talk about later. It is, it is copied to a DNA. So there's an example of a plus RNA that's not a message. Uh, why is mRNA placed at the center of the Baltimore scheme? A, because all virus particles contain mRNA. B, there is no reason. C, because all viral genomes are mRNAs. D, because all viral genomes must make or mRNA. E, because Baltimore studied mRNA. 97% said D, all, because all viral genomes must make mRNA, and that's exactly right. That's the reason we put it in the center of the Baltimore scheme, because every genome has to get to mRNA. Uh, A, because all particles contain mRNA. No, many particles do not. Viruses with double-stranded DNA, for example, they don't have mRNA in it. mRNA is a very specific molecule. It's an RNA, and it's of plus polarity. Now, aside from these seven types of genomes, there are lots of structural diversity that does not play into the seven genome types. And I just want to point it out to you because you're going to encounter it. And these are all the different kinds of, of uh, configurations. So we can see linear DNA. So that would be a linear DNA at the top. It's a double-stranded linear DNA. Uh, there can also be uh, linear RNA molecules. So some DNAs or RNAs can be linear. They can be circular. Here's a circular DNA molecule there, and there's a circular RNA molecule there. It can be segmented. The genome can be in pieces. So here on the, on the upper right is an example of a segmented genome. That's one where the, R, the RNA, and that happens to be RNA, is in pieces. Uh, it can be gapped. So there's a gapped genome underneath uh, the double-stranded genome. It can be single-stranded positive. It can be single-stranded negative double-stranded, it can be ambisense. Look at this, ambisense means it can have both plus and minus on the same molecule. It can be double-stranded, uh, it can be double-stranded DNA or RNA, it can have covalently attached proteins. Some viruses, the ends are covalently linked. So here's a double-stranded linear molecule. So it's very much like the one above it with the double-stranded DNA, except that the ends are covalently linked. So what does that mean? Well, if you melt that molecule with the ends covalently linked, it'll be a single-stranded circle. Because the ends, you know, the, the five prime ends of this double-stranded molecule, five prime and three prime ends, are covalently attached to each other in this. 
And then uh, some genomes have DNA. This is an example of one of the gapped genomes. It has a single strand. Part of the genome is single stranded. And you can tell by the color, by the way, that that's a negative strand. It's kind of a light blue. The darker blue is the plus strand. Part of the genome is double stranded. There's a protein attached to the five prime end uh, of the genome. And there's also a piece of RNA left behind. This is actually how the genome is in the virus particle. It's really baroque. We'll see why it happens later on. But uh, in terms of conventions, this um, kind of Kelly green is plus stranded and the olive color is minus strand. So that's for RNA. For DNA, the, the, the darker blue is plus, the lighter blue is minus. So lots of different genome configurations. Why? Why is this? Well, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say why. What's the function of this genome diversity? You can't ask why questions, right? That's philosophical. But you can ask what's the function of this diversity. So let's start with DNA and RNA. Why do viruses have both DNA and RNA genomes and we, everything else on Earth has DNA genomes? What's so special about viruses? Well, of course, they're really special, right? And that's because they're the oldest, probably the oldest things on the planet. We think RNA appeared first in evolution. There was an RNA world where molecules of RNA existed and they weren't coding for anything at first because there were no cells to make proteins, uh, but they were able to replicate themselves. Um, and um, they had limitations though. RNA as a molecule, as a chemical, has limitations. It can't get very long, it breaks easily, it's susceptible to damage. And so uh, DNA probably evolved from it at some point and it had to have evolved from it at a time when there were already proteins made. So there was an RNA world and then there was a RNA world with proteins and then that evolved into a DNA world. And so today, what's left of the RNA world are, are viral genomes mainly. So they're really relics uh, of what were there originally. And later in the course, towards the end, we're gonna talk about viroids, which are small pieces of circular RNA that don't code for any protein. But that's probably the first RNA molecules that were on the planet non-coding RNA molecules that could just replicate. So they're probably relics. And the RNA viruses are still here because they're successful. They can occupy certain niches and infect hosts and, and propagate, and that's why we, we believe they're still around. Uh, and, uh, an interesting relic from the RNA world is the ribosome, of course. Uh, the catalytic activity of the ribosome is dependent on RNA, not the protein. Uh, and there are other enzymes that are based on RNA as well, ribozymes. So these are all, we think, relics of a very highly evolved RNA world. But uh, what about these other configurations? Linear versus circular versus segmented, double-stranded, single-stranded, plus minus. What is their particular functions? We don't have any answers for that. The only thing I can leave you with is that they all work. They have been evolutionarily successful. They all work, uh, and therefore they're still around. We don't have any particular reason for saying this is better than that. I always think that all viruses should be plus strand RNA viruses, not just because I work on those, but plus it's beautiful. A plus stranded RNA gets in the cell, and it's translated, and it starts the infectious cycle. You don't have to do any of the other things that you'll see we have to go through. But that is unfortunately where we are left. So I think you should really learn this well, these seven genome types and uh, the key virus. And you should also know some key virus families uh, just so that if I say adenovirus, you'll immediately think double-stranded DNA. And these are some of the main, main viruses we're going to talk about. We'll have a core of viruses that we'll focus on to teach you the principles. Uh, and there'll be a few ancillary viruses along the way for various reasons. But for example, double-stranded DNA viruses, the group one, adenoviruses and herpes simplex viruses will be featured. And as I said earlier, all of you have herpes viruses of some kind in you. The single-stranded DNA viruses, parvoviruses, there are human pathogens there. There are also animal pathogens. If you have a dog or a cat, you have to vaccinate them against parvoviruses, otherwise they could die. Single-stranded DNA. We have gapped, double-stranded DNA viruses. Hepatitis B virus is one example of that. There are a few other interesting ones. And we can move into the RNA viruses, double-stranded RNA. Uh, Rio viruses, these are viruses with a double-stranded RNA genome in pieces, and there's, there are a number of human pathogens here. In particular, rotaviruses, causes of uh, gastroenteritis. We'll talk about those. Then we have our minus strand uh, influenza, uh, RNA viruses. An example is influenza virus, a, a substantial, significant human pathogen, especially this time of year. Now, this is right in the middle of the flu season uh, we are. 
and we'll talk a lot about flu, uh, plus stranded RNA viruses like polio virus and retroviruses, which have plus RNA in their virus particle, but go through a DNA intermediate. And I want to go through how some of these genomes are expressed, but I think it's really uh, good for you to get very familiar with this. There's a great site online if you want to learn more about all these viruses it's called Viral Zone, and you can see it's organized by Baltimore category. So there uh, on the top are all the different genome types, double-stranded DNA, single-stranded DNA. You could click on one, so now you click on double-stranded RNA viruses, you get illustrations. Here we are at real viruses. Uh, you could move into different double-stranded RNA viruses. There it shows you all the genome segments, uh, how they work, and so forth. Uh, this is more information than you need for this course, but if you're really interested, this is a great website, uh, and the uh, URL is there on the slides. What's encoded in a viral genome? So obviously, lots of proteins of various sorts. We have to have proteins to replicate the viral genome. We need proteins to assemble the genome and package it. So we need the protective shell of the virus. We need proteins that regulate the replication cycle, right? Viruses don't just enter a cell and make everything at once. They have regulation, especially as the viruses get bigger and more complicated. They have temporal regulation, which we'll talk about. Um, not all viruses do, but many do. We have to have proteins that modulate host defenses. Every virus genome on the planet, as far as we know, has to encode at least one protein to antagonize host defenses, our immune system, and that of other hosts. Because immune systems are so great, if viruses didn't encode antagonists, they would be wiped out. They would be gone. We have really good immune systems. And we'll talk about some of those. But every virus on the planet has at least one protein that can antagonize some aspect of immunity, and some have multiple ones. And those viruses that cause lifelong infections, like the herpes viruses that are in you, all of you, they encode multiple antagonists of immune defenses, and that's why they can stay with you. They don't get cleared. And finally, they have to encode proteins that allow them to spread to other cells and to other hosts. So this is kind of a simplistic view, but it gives you an overview of what's there. But what's not in a viral genome? Maybe that's a more interesting thing to do. There are no genes encoding the complete protein synthesis machinery. And that means you know, ribosomal RNAs and proteins, all the initiation proteins, elongation proteins, terminators, amino acyl tRNA synthetases. Now, up until 10 years ago, we thought no virus genome encoded any of this, but it turns out there are some giant viruses. One of them is shown here. We mentioned it last time. This is a Mimi virus. Some of these have actually encode parts of the translational machinery, like amino acyl tRNA synthetases, even initiation factors, and tRNAs. Not all of them. So none of these have a complete translation system, but they have parts. And we think, nobody's looked at this yet, we think that maybe this allows the virus to fine-tune translation in an infected cell so it's better suited to translating their mRNAs versus mRNAs in the cell itself. There are no genes encoding proteins involved in energy production or membrane biosynthesis. So viruses need a lot of energy, huge amounts of energy, to produce everything they need to make new virus particles. Can't make any ATP on its own has to use it from the cell. And so what happens is viruses kick up the metabolism of cells that they infect because they need energy to make building blocks and to assemble those into viruses. No membrane biosynthesis. A lot of viruses are enveloped. They have a membrane around them. And many viruses replicate in membranous vesicles, and that has to be provided by the cell. There are no centromeres or telomeres that you would see in, like those in our host chromosomes, right? With the ends of our chromosomes, the telomeres, the centromeres in the middle, you don't have anything like that in viral DNA genomes. Now, this is what comes with a caveat, because maybe we haven't found them. You know, as we sequence the viral genomes that we find, 90% uh, of the genes are things we don't even recognize. We put them in a database and hope that one day somebody will work on them and figure out what they do. So maybe buried in that are things that will fulfill some of these functions. But for now, these are things that the host, some of the things that the host has to provide for the virus. I think it's useful to look at the biggest and smallest of viral genomes. So that's what we have here. These are the largest known viral genomes. I have to tell you that the 10 on this slide, we didn't know any of them 10 years ago. They're all recently discovered. 
So the biggest genome was much smaller than 650,000 bases in length. So the biggest so far that we know, uh, Pandora virus, Salinas, uh, which was discovered in, in, uh, in water in Australia, and it's been since discovered somewhere else. The guy who discovered this tells an interesting story. He was at a meeting in Australia, and he, he, at the break, he took his bottle of water, and he just walked to the window of the meeting place, and he looked out, and he saw a muddy pond next to the meeting place. So he poured out his water and went, filled up his water bottle with pond water, brought it back to France, and he isolated this virus from it. You're not supposed to do that. <laughs> but people do things like that. 2.5 million base pairs in length, encoding 2,500 proteins. And most of those proteins, we have no idea what they're doing. And then it goes down from there. There are all sorts of viruses. This one, Bodo Saltans virus, was just discovered recently. It's a, a virus of a small, single-celled eukaryote that lives in waters of the world, 1,200 uh, open reading frames. And you can see these are all really big. And we'll talk about some of them and, and what they encode here. But what about the smallest? The smallest, well, the smallest is called a viroid, 120 bases of RNA. And it doesn't encode any proteins, no protein coding region. And some other viruses are slightly bigger. Again, they don't code for any protein. So we don't really call them viruses. We call them viroids or satellites. But they're probably really old, and we're around in the RNA world. So we start at zero. The hepatitis delta satellite encodes one protein. So we'll talk about this virus later, or this satellite. It can't replicate on its own. It has to replicate in cells infected with hepatitis B virus that provides all the functions this, this satellite needs. The only thing it encodes is a protein that encapsidates it, uh, and that is that one protein. So these top three uh, really uh, are, are very disabled, if, if you will. Now we start with circovirus. This is the first virus, which I would say is a fully autonomous virus. It can get into a cell and replicate and make new virus particles. It doesn't need any other help from any other viruses. And it encodes two proteins, has a genome of 1,700 bases. So that's the smallest viral genome that we know about. Four proteins, uh, two, seven, and so forth. So there are lots of viruses at the lower end that are really simple, but they do really well. You only need a couple of proteins. And these basically orchestrate the host to do everything that the virus needs. And we'll talk about how some of those work. What information may be encoded in a viral genome? A, gene products that catalyze membrane biosynthesis. B, gene products that catalyze energy production. C, complete protein synthesis systems. D, centromeres or telomeres. E, enzymes to replicate the viral genome. So most of you have got enzymes to replicate the viral genome, which is correct, because all the other ones are not correct, so you had to really do this by elimination, because I haven't talked much yet about what replicates the viral genome. But gene products that catalyze membrane biosynthesis, no. Uh, that catalyze energy production, no. Complete protein synthesis, sim synthesis systems, no. Centromeres or telomeres. So let's talk about the different kinds of genomes a bit, some of their properties. Start with viral DNA. Of course, our host system is based on double-stranded DNA, and many DNA viruses emulate the host. They may have emerged from hosts many years ago. But as I said, most DNA genomes are not like our chromosomes, which, is, which has telomeres and centromeres and is wrapped up in chromatin. Uh, most viral genomes in the particle don't look like that, although when they get into the cell and if they, they do go to the nucleus, they do get chromatinized and they look a little bit like host DNA. But in the virus particles, they're not like chromosomes. And as you'll see, and here we have chromatinized DNA, just to remind you, this is what our DNA looks like. Viral DNA pretty much doesn't look like that in the particle until it gets in the cell. But there have been a number of interesting tricks that have evolved to replicate viral genomes. We'll talk about that when we consider DNA synthesis. There's some problems associated with DNA synthesis, like the end problem. And viruses have evolved ways to get around that. Uh, so that's what I mean by that. So here are some double viruses with double-stranded DNA genomes, and we will talk about a few of these in great detail. We have our adenoviruses. They are very characteristic. They, are, they have a capsid with these Sputnik-like spikes coming out. We'll explain how all of these are built later on. We have our herpes viruses. 
Uh, those are two pretty big viruses, and the pox viruses are large. They have large genomes, although nowhere near the, the size of some of those giant viruses I showed you. And papilloma and polyoma viruses uh, as well, and we'll talk about them because they have been great models for understanding DNA replication. So these genomes, double-stranded DNA, they can be transcribed to make mRNA directly. So double-stranded DNA is the only DNA molecule that can be directly transcribed to mRNA. That's just something you have to remember because we have other configurations of DNA. We have gapped and we have single-stranded DNA. The other things have to happen first before mRNA can be made. So these DNAs get in the cell. They make their way to the nucleus. They're transcribed to mRNA. The mRNAs can be translated into proteins and the proteins can participate in uh, DNA replication and eventually they form new virus particles with new DNA genomes that are produced. And I divide the, the double-stranded DNA viruses into two groups, uh, the little ones and the big ones. So on the left, the little genomes, they can encode a lot of proteins, and so they don't have a DNA polymerase. They have to be replicated by the host DNA polymerase. So the only way you can remember that is to remember that they're small. Here, these polyoma and papilloma, 5,000 to 8,000 double-stranded uh, base pairs in length, circular molecules, and they cannot encode a lot of protein. So the polymerase has been left out because the host cell will provide one. These viruses on the right, uh, these genomes encode DNA polymerases. They're bigger for the most part. And so once you get beyond a certain size of double-stranded DNA genome, they all encode their own DNA polymerase. And here we have uh, the adenovirus, 36 to 48,000 base pairs in length. It's a double-stranded linear DNA. We have the herpes virus, which is also a double-stranded linear DNA. It's not drawn correctly here, but it should look very much like the adenovirus. It's bigger, 120 to 220,000 base pairs in length. And the pox virus is 130,000 to 375,000 base pairs in length. And we used to think these were the biggest viruses, the biggest viral genomes, 375,000, but now we have 600,000 up to uh, over a million, over two million genomes copied by host polymerase and genomes that are not. Uh, let's look at the gapped DNA genomes. So there it is on the left. Uh, this is in viruses, the hepadenoviridae. It's a family, and one virus example is hepatitis B virus. Many, many people globally are infected with hepatitis B virus, 300 to 400 million people, uh, which is spread by contaminated needles, and other roots as well. And this can get into your liver and cause a lot of damage. You can get long-term replication in liver cancer as a consequence. So these are very successful viruses. The genome is gapped. It's got a single strand, minus strand of DNA, and then uh, it's partially double-stranded. So you can see the plus strand only covers about half the molecule. It's got a protein stuck on the end of the minus strand DNA, and it's got a little piece of RNA left over. These are all remnants of the replication cycle that we'll talk about later. The point here, though, is that that molecule right there can't be made into mRNA. The only thing that can be made into mRNA is a double-stranded DNA molecule among the DNA viruses. So what happens in cells is this uh, gapped molecule is brought in the cell by the virus, goes into the nucleus where it is repaired. The nucleus has lots of enzymes that repair DNA breaks. We're always getting DNA breaks, right? time you go out in the sun, you're getting DNA breaks, and your enzymes are furiously repairing them so they don't cause mutations. They repair this DNA so it's fully double-stranded circular with no protein and no RNA, and then it can serve as a template for transcription of uh, mRNA, and the mRNA goes to make proteins. Uh, the MR, among the mRNAs, one encodes a protein called reverse transcriptase, and that enzyme takes some of the RNAs, some of the plus RNAs, makes a minus DNA copy, and then a double-stranded DNA copy, and that's what ends up in the virion. And this process of reverse transcription is what generates this funny molecule, and we'll talk about that later. But the key here is that, again, a gapped DNA with protein stuck on it and RNA, this is no way this is going to be transcribed to make mRNA. You need a double-stranded DNA molecule. So if you remember that little fact, that you need double-stranded DNA to make mRNA, then you can understand how a lot of these viruses work. So let's take a single-stranded DNA genome. Can it be transcribed to mRNA? No. No way. It has to be made double-stranded. And so these viruses, they can package either minus or plus DNA or both. They come in the cell. 
Uh, these are viruses that do not encode a DNA polymerase. So it's a kind of a conundrum. They can't be transcribed as a single-stranded DNA. They can't be made double-stranded because they can't make an enzyme to do it. So they depend on the host cell to repair. It's basically a repair mechanism. It goes from single to double-stranded DNA. And then you end up with a double-stranded DNA, which can be transcribed to make mRNAs and then the proteins you would need to replicate this virus. These genomes come either circular, single-stranded, and there's one called TT, torquetanovirus. Everybody's got this. If I did a serosurvey survey of you, you'd all have antibodies to this virus. It probably doesn't make anybody sick. Maybe it's good for us. We have no idea, but everyone has it. Uh, and then there are these parvoviruses that I mentioned infect your pets. They have single-stranded DNAs with interesting structures at the ends, which will be talking about when we talk about how they replicate their genomes. This B19 parvovirus causes a human disease called, called fifth disease. You know, in the old days, there were lots of rash diseases that kids got, and this was the fifth one after measles and mumps and rubella, chickenpox, and so forth. Measles, mumps, rubella, chickenpox. This was the fifth disease that kids would get. Uh, and nowadays, most of those we don't get anymore because we're immunized against all of them. Which DNA genome? on entry into the cell can immediately be copied into mRNA. Double-stranded DNA, gap double-stranded, circular single-stranded, linear single-stranded, all of the above. Got it, the first, I was interested to see when the first 100% comes up. So this is good, it's very early on. I don't know about the other people who didn't answer. I hope you got double-stranded DNA. So that's it, double-stranded DNA is only one that can be copied into mRNA, so you've got that down, and that's gonna help you a lot. All right, let's look at RNA genomes. These are um, a lot of different configurations. You can have plus or minus. You can have segmented in pieces. This is a minus segmented virus. Double-stranded, uh, circular. Here's the key for this one. Just like double-stranded DNA to mRNA, here's another key. Cells have no RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. They have DNA-dependent RNA polymerases, and that, that's what makes our mRNAs from our DNA, right? But they have no RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. So all of these RNA viruses, with one exception, has to encode its own RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which I abbreviate RDRP. And these RDRPs not only make mRNAs from these RNA genomes, but they replicate the genome as well. There's always an exception. So this molecule here, this uh, viroid-like RNA. It looks like it's actually copied by a DNA-dependent RNA polymerase in the cell. We'll talk about that later. So viroids that infect plants, uh, hepatitis delta virus, which is a human satellite. They don't, the viroids encode no proteins. The, sat, the delta encodes one protein. Uh, these appear to be copied by a DNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which you would never have predicted. This is not DNA, right? But it is a double-stranded RNA, and maybe that's why it's recognized by the enzyme. So that's copied by a cell enzyme, but it's not an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. It's a DNA-dependent RNA polymerase. So no cell encodes an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. You remember that? You can really figure a lot of things out about these RNA viruses. They have to have their own polymerase. Another step you can take, which is really interesting, is whether or not that RNA-dependent RNA polymerase has to be in the virus particle or not. So some viruses package the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase in the virus particle, and others do not. The particle has just RNA in it, okay? And you're gonna be able to figure this out. It makes a lot of sense, so let's, let's go through that. Here, is virus, here are viruses with double-stranded RNA genomes. These are real viruses. Uh, they have three, six, seven, eight, nine, ten segments. Some of them have 11. Each segment encodes one or two proteins. So here's double-stranded. RNA. Double-stranded RNA has a plus strand hybridized to a minus strand. Now, if you were to guess, would you think that that plus strand could be translated into protein? Who thinks it would be translated? Raise your hand. Who thinks it would not be translated? Raise your hand. And the others don't care. This is not translatable, even though there's a plus strand in there that Kelly Green can't be translated. Ribosomes can't get at it. Just Think of it as a physical access thing. It's double-stranded. How, how's the ribosome going to get it? So you have to transcribe the minus strand to make plus strand in the cell so that you can translate that into proteins. 
So if you have a double-stranded RNA in a virus particle, and cells don't have any RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, what has to be in this particle to make that mRNA? Got to have an RNA polymerase in the particle, because the first step is production of mRNA. If the first step were translation of that mRNA, the plus strand, then you wouldn't need an RNA polymerase. So that's the defining feature. If you can translate what is in the particle, then you don't need an RNA polymerase in the particle. So these viruses, these double-stranded RNAs, cannot be translated, so they have to be copied to a mRNA, which happens in the cell, and the, the virus has to bring that polymerase in with it, because it can't make it, right? If it can't make mRNAs, it can't make an enzyme. So it has to be brought in, and that's what copies these double strands into mRNAs, which can then go on to make uh, viral proteins. So that's double-stranded RNA. Here are viruses with plus sense RNA. I call it plus sense or plus strand, doesn't, doesn't matter. Plus is the key here. A number of really important uh, viruses here. A lot of, there's a lot of diversity in RNA viruses, lots of different kinds, lots of human pathogens, because uh, these viruses are very mutagenic, and we'll see why later. So we have picornaviruses, which include poliovirus and rhinoviruses. I have a rhinovirus right now, probably, replicating in my upper tract, and I hope none of you acquire it. It's not that bad. It lasts for a few days. It's annoying. Uh, I know it's a rhinovirus because it's staying in my nasopharynx. If it were going down into my respiratory tract, then it would be probably influenza or maybe an adenovirus. So those are common cold viruses. These are very prevalent. Polio is about to be eradicated. It's caused paralysis for many years. Plus strand RNA viruses. Khaleesi viruses cause gastroenteritis. This is the cruise ship virus. Noroviruses, we'll talk about those a bit. Coronavirus, SARS coronavirus, MERS coronavirus, which infects camels throughout the world, and people get sick in the Middle East because they have camels as pets or as racing animals, or they eat them, so they get MERS coronavirus from their camels. Then we have flaviviruses. You know what flavus means in Latin? Nobody ever took Latin, huh? Neither did I, but it means yellow. <laughs> and the first flavivirus was yellow fever virus. The virus infects your liver, you get jaundice, and you look yellow. So people got sick, they looked yellow, they called it yellow fever, and eventually yellow fever virus, when they figured out it was a virus, and then they named the family Flavi, because Flavus means yellow. Uh, we have yellow fever, West Nile, hepatitis C, and Zika virus. They're all Flavies. And then we have Toga viruses, Rubella viruses, a Togo. These all have plus-stranded RNA genomes. They're the, some configurations there on the left. They're different lengths. They have different things at their ends, which we don't need to concern ourselves about right now. Uh, the point is this, this is plus RNA. So there, does there need to be an RNA polymerase in these virus particles? No, it doesn't. Because that plus RNA can get into the cell, it goes in the cytoplasm, and immediately ribosomes hook onto it and they start making proteins. You don't need an RNA polymerase. These are all, these viruses all have just a shell and a plus RNA into it. The, the ultimate simplicity, I mean, that's why I said before, these should, they should have dominated the world, these viruses, but you still keep other viruses that need to go around this. All right, so that's plus strand RNA strategy. Now here we have these plus RNAs that don't translate that mRNA when it goes into the cell. So these are retroviruses. The family is retroviridae, two, two human pathogens, human immunodeficiency virus, HIV, and human T lymphotropic virus, HTLV. Uh, and of course, you know that we have a huge AIDS pandemic ongoing because of HIV right now, and we will talk about that in a lecture of its own. But these viruses have an RNA genome. It's plus-stranded. And if I told you nothing else, you would say, ah, there probably doesn't have to be a polymerase in those particles. But in fact, the way these replicate is very different. When this RNA gets into the cell, it is not translated. And probably that's in part because it remains shrouded in a subviral particle so the ribosomes can't access it. Certainly if you extract the RNA from these viruses and put it in an in vitro translation system or even in a cell, it will be translated because it's plus strand RNA, it is mRNA. But in the life cycle of these, or the reproductive cycle of these viruses, it is not translated. So here's the retroviral genome, plus stranded. It's capped and polyadenylated. It looks very much like an mRNA. But when it comes in the cell, it is not translated, it is copied into a minus DNA strand by 
reverse transcriptase. And of course, that enzyme is in the virus particle. It turns out there are very, very low amounts of reverse transcriptase in all of our cells, but probably not enough to carry out this reproductive cycle. So you're just going to have to remember that the retroviruses carry a reverse transcriptase, which makes minus DNA and then double-stranded DNA, because remember, you need to make minus DNA to make mRNA. The, the other twist that happens here is this double-stranded DNA then goes in the nucleus and integrates into chromosomal DNA. And there it is transcribed by DNA-dependent RNA polymerase to make messenger RNAs. The integrated retroviral DNA, and you all have a good percent of your genome, which consists of integrated retroviral DNA that you've inherited from your parents and they got it from their parents, all the way back to pre-homo sapiens, virus infections that happened ages ago. The virus was integrated and stayed with us. They went in our germline. Uh, that integrated DNA is called the provirus. So when I say provirus, I mean integrated retroviral DNA, okay? It is not unintegrated. It's integrated into our host chromosome. And there, integrated into our host chromosome, mRNAs are then made and the proteins can be made that drive the replicative cycle. And let's end up with the minus sense single-stranded RNA viruses. Lots of pathogens here, measles and mumps viruses, uh, rabies, Ebola and Marburg viruses, influenza virus and Lassa virus. These are all envelope viruses of different morphologies with negative strand RNA genomes. Now you notice that when I draw these negative strand RNA genomes, they're always they're always coated with some yellow stuff. You can't see the, the, the green very well, right? And here, the, the arenas are actually ambisense. They're half plus-stranded and half minus-stranded. But these are all proteins coding the negative-strand RNA. And among those proteins is the RNA polymerase. Because remember, these negative-strand RNA viruses have to bring in a polymerase with them because the negative-strand RNA can't be translated by definition. It has to be copied to plus RNA. There's no host RNA polymerase that can copy it, so the virus brings it in. Every one of these viruses in the particle has a couple of copies of the viral RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. So as soon as these genomes get in the cell, that enzyme starts cranking out messenger RNAs. So that's, that's something that you could figure out by just knowing a few things about uh, plus and minus strand and, and RNA polymerases. Uh, there's a great book called Fever, The Hunt for a New Killer Virus. This was a vi Lassa virus, was a, an emerging virus discovered in the 60s in Africa. One of the, pretty much the first emerged new virus that we saw and all the other viruses we, we discovered as, as we went along. But this one just popped out of nowhere seemingly. And now we know that this happens frequently when viruses transfer from animals to people. But this was a book I read uh, after college. Um, I, you know, I graduated college, I was working in a lab and I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I read this and I said, I gotta be a virologist. So this is what makes, that's why I'm here today because of this book. And it takes place at Columbia in part. It's a really cool story. Uh, later on when we talk about vaccines, we'll, we'll talk a little bit of that story, but uh, it's really good. You can still pick it up. And finally, we have minus strand RNAs, um, single stranded RNA. I haven't told you anything about the genome configuration yet. It can come in two, two ways. It can come segmented or it can come non-segmented. So the influenza viruses, for example, have a segmented minus strand genome. Uh, the, Mumps and measles viruses have non-segmented Ebola, Marburg, uh, rabies virus. They all have non-segmented genomes. Now, having a segmented genome is really important because it allows much greater genetic variation. And that's because if you infect a cell with two different viruses, so here we have two different influenza viruses, which are genetically distinct. Uh, and have, one has a red genome, the other has a blue genome. They go in, in the infected cell, the genomes multiply as part of the reproductive cycle. And when new viruses are made, they pull from a pool of RNA segments. So you can imagine, you know, you're going to get some of either parent, but you're going to get some where the segments are mixed, like this one, which has a red and the rest blue. That's called reassortment. It's very high frequency. So uh, as far as we know, RNA genomes at least minus strand RNA genomes don't recombine like DNA genomes do. It seems to be that RNA plus stranded RNA genomes can recombine by another mechanism, but it's very low frequency. This is really high frequency, and that's why flu is a problem, because all the strains that are out there circulating, human strains, animal strains, they can 
co-infect a host and reassort, and out can pop new viruses with new properties. That may be a problem. So reassortment, consequence of a segmented genome, uh, very important, not only for influenza viruses, but other viruses with segmented genome as well. And finally, the last one is our ambisense genomes. I wanted to show you this because it's very weird. So we have plus-stranded RNA, we have minus strand, and then we have some which is both. Can't decide what it wants to be. So here's the genome of this arena virus, like Lassa virus. A little bit of it is plus-stranded, you can tell by the color, and a little bit of it is minus-stranded. And this, this virus has to have a polymerase in the particle because when this RNA infects a cell, uh, this, you would think that this little open reading frame here could be translated. It's a plus RNA, it's cap. I would say, yeah, it could be translated, but it's not. For whatever reason, it's not translated. So this genome has to be uh, transcribed. And in fact, the first mRNAs made are complementary to this minus sequence down here at the three prime end. So this virus has to bring in an RNA polymerase that will do this transcription. This is not something you could predict, unfortunately, because as I said, I would say, yeah, this is going to be translated because this plus open reading frame is here, but, but it is not. That's uh, ambisense viruses. Now, so far I've been drawing these RNAs as squiggles, right, like that, but of course they don't look like that. They're much more complicated. They're highly structured, and we, we call this secondary structure. We have these stem loop structures that form in RNAs. So here at the five prime end is a stem loop structure. The bases are complementary to one another. They form this structure with a loop at the top. They can be pretty extensive and have multiple bulges in them. And they can also have long range interactions. So this is actually the structure of a plant virus RNA, which forms these particular stem loops. Look at this, look at this one. This is huge. It goes on and on and on. And this red part here on the right interacts with, it base pairs with this red part at the very five prime end, and the blue parts interact as well. They interact via base pairing. So they're sec higher order structures. And all of these are important. If you take them away, the virus can't replicate, and probably they're important so proteins can bind and so forth. But this is really the way genomes look like. Of course, they don't look this big, and they're all compact and compressed, but uh, I'll be still drawing them as a line because it makes it easier to see what they are. All right, our last question for today, I think it's the last one. Which statement about viral RNA genomes is correct? A single, plus single-stranded RNA genomes may be translated to make viral protein. B, double-stranded RNA genomes can be directly translated to make viral protein. C, sing, plus single-stranded RNA virus replication cycles do not require a minus-strand intermediate. D, RNA genomes can be copied by host cell RNA-dependent RNA polymerases, and all of the above. All right, most of you got A, single-stranded plus SSRNA genomes may be translated to make protein. So that's true, right? So the plus-strand RNA viruses can be translated. The retroviruses, they're not, but that's part of the may, right? B, double-stranded RNA can be directly translated. No. Ribosomes can address the plus-strand in the double-strand. Plus, single-strand replication cycles do not require a minus-strand intermediate. They do. How do you get to more plus except by going through a minus, right? You have to replicate the genomes. Uh, D, RNA genomes can be copied by host cell polymerases. RNA-dependent RNA polymerases. No, they can be copied by DNA-dependent RNA polymerases, but not RNA and then not all of the above. So that's, that shows to me that it's a little confusing there. Um, but I think you can understand that the plus single-strand RNA is the one that, that can be translated. All right, let's turn to genetics. Using techniques to make alterations in the genome and studying the functions of proteins and replication pathogenesis. And this is the key to doing genetics on animal viruses, the plaque assay. And many years, this was discovered in the 50s for animal viruses. It allows you to clonally purify a single virus from, a virus population from a single initial virus infection. So remember, each plaque starts with a single virus infection. Let's say, well, in the old days, people would mutagenize viruses with UV light or with chemical mutagens. They'd have a big population of viruses, and then they would plaque them out and pick individual viruses with different mutations in their genome. So this method was key for the ability to study individual mutants. We don't really do that kind of mutagenesis anymore. We have very specific ways of introducing mutations into genomes. And today we use infectious DNA copies of viral genomes. We call this engineering mutations into the genomes the modern way. 
So we have, for any virus that's out there, we can make a DNA copy of it, whether it's an RNA virus or a DNA virus, we can clone it into a bacterial plasmid. So as you know, uh, bacteria have their own large DNA molecules and they have smaller circular plasmids, which can move from bacterium to bacterium, often encode antibiotic resistance. But we learned to harvest these plasmids in the 70s. They were common in DNA revolution and insert viral genomes into them. So now you can grow up lots of viral DNA in a plasmid, in a bacteria, and you can make mutations in it. You can make recombinants between different viruses. The last uh, lecture of this course will talk about viral gene therapy, using viruses to deliver genes for therapeutic uses, for, for killing tumors. All that is possible because we can manipulate genomes now of viruses uh, using infectious DNA copies of their genomes. When you think about it, and this is called transfection, we introduce a DNA copy of the viral genome into a cell, virus comes out, the virus reproduction cycle starts, that's called transfection infection. And it's a, really a modern validation of Hershey Chase. It proves that the DNA is the genetic material, right? Because you're putting just viral DNA into cells and out comes more virus. So that means DNA is the genetic material. And you can, as I said, you can use these to make deletions, insertions, substitutions, nonsense, minsense, any kind of mutation you want. You can add genes to a virus, you can take it away. We'll see later, you can add an antigen and make a vaccine out of a different virus. Incredible, incredible versatility. So that's what we all use to do our genetic methods. And transfection, the word was coined initially by the production of infectious virus after introducing DNA of uh, bacteriophage lambda into bacteria. When you introduce DNA into cells, that's called DNA-mediated transformation. We don't just call it transformation because that's used to describe a change in cells on the way to becoming cancerous. We call that transformation of cells. So DNA-mediated transformation is what we call putting DNA into cells. And transfection or transformation infection was what these early experiments were called putting a viral DNA copy into cells and getting virus out. Unfortunately, now everyone uses transfection for just putting DNA into cells because DNA-mediated transformation is too hard, it's too long. So you don't get confused. You can hear transfection, but they may not be talking about uh, virus infection. So here's an example of an infectious DNA clone. Uh, here is a polio virus, which is a virus with a plus-stranded viral RNA. And of course, when you infect cells with polio virus, out come more, more polio viruses in about four hours, right? If you extract the viral RNA from poliovirus particles, you can introduce that into cells by transfection and out will come cultured cells. And you know why that works, because that's a plus strand RNA and it's translated to make all the viral proteins, which then go on to initiate the infectious cycle. So what was done in the 70s was to make a DNA copy of this RNA, clone it into a bacterial plasma. So now we have poliovirus DNA. And if you put that into cells, it gives rise to RNA, which initiates an infectious cycle. Or you can transcribe RNA in vitro using enzymes. You make RNA and put that into cells, and that will also initiate an infection. The point here is that we now have an infectious DNA copy of this genome. We can make any kind of change to it that we would like to make. And this has been done pretty much for every virus that people work with. It's been done with HIV and modified it so it's no longer pathogenic, and we can use it to deliver genes in gene therapy. We'll talk about that in the last lecture. Here's another example I want to point out because I want to tell you about a use of this. This is influenza virus. Now, the influenza virus genome is, is eight single-stranded RNA segments. All right, so what they had to do was to make a DNA copy of each of these eight segments. And then they take eight plasmids and put them into cells and get influenza virus out. But it's actually more complicated than that because it turns out that uh, you have to set up the, each plasmid in this way. So you have the viral DNA in the middle, and then you have a Paul 2 promoter at one end. Paul 2 is the enzyme that makes our mRNAs, so that's going to make the mRNA for each influenza virus segment. At the other end of the DNA, we have a Paul 1 promoter, which is going to transcribe the other strand, and that's going to make a negative strand viral RNA. So you put these eight plasmids into the cells, you're getting both plus and minus RNA made. The plus RNA is translated, you get proteins that will then go on and replicate the genome and make infectious virus. So anytime you want to make infectious influenza virus from 
plasmids from DNA, you need to use eight plasmids. And again, this is used to modify influenza viruses extensively. People are trying to derive new vaccines and so forth using this technology. I can't emphasize how important this is for pushing the field forward. But maybe you can also think that this, in the wrong hands, this could be a problem, this technology, right? Because you could modify a virus to do whatever you want if you could figure out something nefarious, I suppose. And here's an example of some, an experiment that people have been worried about. Uh, this is an experiment where the 1918 influenza virus was resurrected. Wrong word, because viruses are not living to start with, but you get the idea. 1918, there was a huge global pandemic, millions of people died of, the, of this influenza virus. Eventually it went away, but we didn't have influenza virus at the time. In fact, the first influenza virus was not isolated until 1933. So the 1918 pandemic came and went and no one ever had that virus to work with. It would be interesting to work with it to see why it was so deadly. Fast forward 2005, some people decided to let's use this DNA technology to reconstruct the 1918 influenza virus. So they did two things. First, remember 1918 is World War I. Lots of American soldiers died in that war and lots of them died of influenza. Some of them over here in, in camps throughout the US. So when they die, when a soldier dies, they usually take samples, especially if they don't know the cause of death. <clears throat> they take samples, they embed them in paraffin and fix them and they store them. And these samples are still there. You can find a place in in Washington, uh, in, in the Washington area, where you have lots of samples from 1918 from soldiers who died of flu. So a group took, went and got some of these lung tissue samples. <coughs> they were able to extract pieces of influenza virus RNA from them. Okay, so if you have the RNA, you could sequence it and then synthesize a DNA plasmid. Unfortunately, that wasn't enough to reconstruct all eight RNA segments. So then what they did is they went up to, uh, Alaska, and a number of people had died of flu in 1918. They were buried in the permafrost. It's always frozen there. So they, they opened the graves, and they did a lung biopsy, took a piece of tissue out, extracted RNA, and they completed the sequence with that. So this sequence comes from two sources, paraffin-embedded tissue of, of soldiers who died from somewhere in D.C., and a biopsy of lungs from people who died in, in uh, Alaska and who were frozen ever since then. They got the complete nucleotide sequence of all eight segments. They made DNA copies of each one, and they put this into cells and they recovered 1918 influenza virus. Now, a lot of people were very upset about this experiment because they said, oh, you're gonna release this and it's gonna cause another pandemic, right? Well, that never happened because we work, we know how to work under containment that prevents viruses from getting out. But you could argue, well, people make mistakes. So even if you have a very strict protocol for containment, something's gonna happen, right? But nothing did happen. And in the meantime, people studied these viruses, 1918 flu viruses. You'd have to do this in a BSL-4 facility, by the way, where you have to wear a spacesuit and you're in isolation and, and the viruses never come out of the room and so forth. They, they could find that you can inhibit these viruses with contemporary antivirals, which is good to know. We could learn about uh, we do animal experiments and learn why this virus was more lethal. So we learned a lot from studying this, but this really catalyzed a industry in the U.S. where people started to worry about what we call synthetic virology. We can make a virus from a DNA. As long as you have the sequence, you can make the virus from it. So, for example, smallpox virus was eradicated in 1979. H huge scourge of humanity. Hundreds of millions of people died. Eradicated. This is fantastic by vaccination. But the sequence is in PubMed. You can go into PubMed and you can find the sequence of smallpox virus. And if you want to, you can synthesize the whole thing. Now it is 350,000 bases. So it's hard to do. Uh, so not any, anyone is going to be able to do this. But in theory, it could be done. So people began to worry about people making viruses like smallpox, 1918 flu. And so a commission was set up in the U.S. called uh, the National Science Advisory Board <laughs> for biosecurity. So again, it's using synthetic virology to make something that could be dangerous. And this is a committee, it's a federal committee that provides oversight of what we call dual use research. So let's say you recover the 1918 influenza virus and you wanna see if it's resistant or sensitive to contemporary antivirals. That is a good goal to do. However, someone could take the virus and use it for nefarious purposes. So we say that that 1918 virus has dual use potential. It could be used for good and for bad. Someone could get a hold of it 
and release it in some way. So this committee looks at experiments. You have, if you're going to do an experiment with a dangerous pathogen like 1918 flu or smallpox or others, Ebola, you have to get it past not only your institutional committees, but this federal committee as well. And they will say, um, and you know, they consider national security, the needs of the research community. So they say, okay, is this an experiment that has to be done? And they make a decision about uh, whether you can do these experiments are not. And, and not too long ago, a, a, a huge controversy emerged where some individuals were trying to take an avian influenza virus called H5N1, which very rarely infects people and doesn't transmit very well by aerosol among those people. This is a bird virus. And they wanted to make it transmissible by aerosol by modifying the genome. So many people got upset about that, and this committee got involved. And this, this happens on a regular basis now, that when people want to propose these kinds of experiments, they have to be vetted properly. But I, what, the reason I tell you all this is that we have mechanisms in place to review these experiments and decide whether they're worth doing or not. And I think they work very well, but the public does not understand it. A case in point, uh, not too long ago, a week or two ago, a group in Canada was able to synthesize the entire genome of a pox virus. It's the first time that's been done. So it is a vaccine strain, so it's not pathogenic. But they showed that you could put from small oligonucleotides, you could stitch enough together to get a 350,000 base genome, and they recovered virus from it. And if you look in the press, if you just search pox virus, synthetic pox virus, uh, in the news of the past week, you'll see lots of articles saying scientists are out of control. They're making these dangerous viruses. So what I like to do is inform people that these have good intentions and they're worth doing experimentally. You know, the problem is if someone wants to use these viruses to harm humanity, it's not going to be scientists here in the U.S. working in laboratories to answer questions. It's going to be someone else who's not going to listen to the NSABB. So in a way, I think it's futile to regulate uh, research in this way when the people who are going to do those experiments are not going to listen to our regulation. But this is part of science now, and it's the same with cloning. You've seen probably that a uh, primate has been cloned now, uh, just like Dolly the sheep was cloned many years ago. Primate was cloned. There's all kinds of debate about uh, genome modifications and such. We can do so many cool things, we're stuck with this kind of debate now. We've learned about the genome now. Next time, I want to tell you how that's packaged into virus particles. What are the principles of building different sorts of virus particles?